Hello, I'm Dr. Lisa Belial, and you are listening to or watching Radio Maine, our video podcast that celebrates creativity and the human spirit, which is sponsored by and produced by the Portland Art Gallery located in Portland, Maine. Today, I'm speaking with Portland Art Gallery artist, Catherine Breer. Good to have you today. Thank you. So I should say that you are a very new Portland Art Gallery artist, however, you are by no means a new artist. You have been in the main art scene for decades? 20 years? That's maybe. two decades. Yeah. That's, that's a long time. It goes by fast. Yes, it does. I, I'm fascinated, however, by the fact that you grew up in Seoul, Korea. Yeah. Tell me about that. Yeah. So my parents um, were missionaries. They were both professors. My dad um, was a professor at a seminary, and my mom was a professor of social work, and I grew up in Seoul. We moved there when I was two, and so I grew up, you know, speaking the language, surrounded by Korean culture, and um, it's really culturally my home. I probably spent 20 years there altogether. And do you go back? I have not been back since 2006. Do you think my, you will go back? Yes. My plan is to try to go back in the next few years. My daughter is adopted from Korea as well, so would love to go back with her. She's 24 now. Yeah. It seems like that could be a really inter- interesting yes. experience, because I'm guessing that if you haven't been back for a while, there might have been some changes. Oh, yeah. Well, even in 2006 when we went back, my old neighborhood, which was this sleepy little neighborhood tucked behind um, Ehua University, which is one of the biggest women's universities in the world. We had this wonderful little quiet neighborhood of one-story houses. And I went back and I was like, I I don't even know where my street is. And I finally found where my house was. There was an eight-story building, completely changed. Um, Yeah. But it's still... It still is the smells and the sounds and the sights that, you know, really pull at my heartstrings. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Because I, every so often, I don't know if I'm in a state of like dozing off or like daydreaming or whatever it is, I'll just get these weird flashes of houses that I grew up in when I was, you know, much, much younger. I have no idea why. I'm not, I'm not thinking about growing up. I'm not thinking about those houses, but the fact that they're kind of flashing into my memory, it tells me, all right, those neurons are still hanging on mm. to that. And it really was an important part of my development. So I'm, I guess it makes me wonder in your case, how much of an impact did it have on your future creativity? Well, that's interesting because I, for a long time, I didn't make a connection. I wasn't really sure what the connection was. I knew there was something And then I realized one day I was looking at, I love the paintings on the Buddhist temples in Korea. They're very colorful, very geometric, bright. Um, And all of a sudden I realized, you know, that's, maybe that's where I draw a connection. Like I love color. I love pattern. Um, I'm also a graphic designer in my, my professional life has been a graphic designer So I think there is a connection there, for sure. So I didn't know that about the paintings in the Buddhist temples in Korea. When I think of Buddhism, I think kind of, I think water lilies and lotuses and serenity and and simplicity. And um, maybe I have to rethink my understanding. Well, I think a lot of those things do come out in my work, you know, Um, my palette has changed over the years. I, I don't think my, my palette isn't quite as bright as it was maybe 20 years ago. I think maybe there was more of a connection there in terms of color. Um, but yeah, there, there's a lot of, um, connection there. I think that's, it may be kind of buried even, you know, and I have yet to discover what those connections are. Why at this stage in your career have you decided to affiliate with an art gallery. I I know that you, you've had different phases of putting Mm -hmm. your art into the world. And I think you're pretty well known independently as an artist. So what, what is the actual benefit to you of making the shift? Well, there's a number of reasons, but I, I love the idea of 
my art being somewhere that is so accessible. So Portland Art Gallery right on, you know, Middle Street, I think, right? <laughs> I'm still getting ready for this. So, um, you know, people can walk in off the street. It's beautiful. It's big space. I'm in the company of some other really amazing artists, many of whom I already know. So it's kind of like, it feels like kind of like a family almost um, with those other artists. We've all done shows together. We've all been in, um, you know, auctions, plein air auctions together. Um, so we, a lot of us go way back. Um, and I think just the visibility, um, getting my work out there more, I tend to be pretty prolific. So um, I just love to get more eyes on my work, I guess. I mean, I personally have always loved your work. And I think because I live in Yarmouth and I know you're from Freeport and, and maybe that's because I just happen to be around it. But it's for me, it's something that's very recognizable mm -hmm. and something that um, I always kind of equate with this area, with with Yarmouth, with Maine, for me personally. Right. Um, but I think there is something, I would say it's your, it's somewhat iconic, really, mm. for the region. That's a really wonderful <laughs> thing to hear. Thank you. Um, I mean, I do, there's, I never run out of, things to paint in Maine. It just, it's endless. There's so many things. And then I'll get on these jags where I, oh, I love painting reflections in the water. And so I'll do that for a while or clouds. Um, I have a series that I always had in the back of my mind that I've wanted to do. And I've done, I've, I've completed two paintings in this sort of series of it's that it's dusk and looking in people's windows or is that it's that feeling of like the darkness with the light. Um, that's something I really want. That's a, that's a series that I think is, is in the future at some point. What is your connection to Maine? It's a, it's pretty far away from Seoul. I know it's so funny. So, um, random, just completely random. My, uh, ex-husband and I, um, we had moved out to Seattle when we got married, and then we were coming back to the East Coast. He was from Boston. We didn't want to go back to Boston. And we had really discovered our love of the outdoors when we were in Seattle. So we had a short list of Northampton, Massachusetts, Burlington, Vermont, and Portland, Maine. We thought we're sort of politically and, you know, just matched up with what we wanted. And, and I said, I've got to go to the ocean I, I have to go to the ocean. So we just, we just came to Portland. We, neither of us have jobs. People were like, what are you doing? And it, I've been here ever since. And that was 30 years ago. So that's, that's an interesting thing. I mean, I was, I was born in Burlington and I've, I went to medical school in Burlington. I love Burlington, mm -hmm. but I feel exactly the same way. You know, I, I visit Burlington, you know, our, our son lives out in Burlington and I still would never, I can't get that far away from the ocean. No, to me, the ocean is everything. It's just, it's so healing. Just smelling it and being near it. Um, I really, I need, I don't know, somehow I need that connection. I grew up um, in Seoul, obviously not on the ocean, but every summer we went to this, it, it was magical place where, uh, the mission, a lot of missionaries had these really rustic cabins. They were hilarious, you know, with, with like bats would get in and, you know, some of them didn't have electricity, but it was right on the ocean and we would just spend the whole summer there. And, you know, I just, I always think about that. And that's really uh, formative to me being near the ocean. Given that both of your parents were missionaries and both of your parents were professors, did you ever feel pulled to go in that direction yourself? It's interesting. I never, I went along, you know, to church and we would go to country churches and my dad would preach and it, they're expected to preach for quite some time. And I, you know, I am a child and I'm just like looking, trying to get his eye and looking at my watch, like yawning, trying to... <laughs> get him to stop. But I never, I never felt, I don't know. I, I never had that belief like they did. Um, my father's belief was much more intellectual. My mother's was very visceral and 
Um, they're both incredibly, you know, intelligent, smart. Uh, obviously, my mother went to Columbia. My dad went to Yale. Um, but I never really felt a connection. And it wasn't until I discovered Buddhism, maybe. And it's funny, I grew up with Buddhism. I never really knew much about it till I finally started studying and learning about it. And I was like, this is more what I feel and believe. And so I've had conversations with my dad and mom about it. And I think it bothered my mom more that I wasn't more religious, but my father and I can talk about, talk about it pretty openly and he gets it. And what is it about Buddhism in particular that appeals to you? I think it's just the, um, the, reverence for the earth, the reverence for um, the, the, the peace and kindness and the way of looking at relationships and the world. Um, it just feels like a really kind um, way to live. And I, th I saw a lot of um, hypocrites, you know, growing up, a lot of people who were missionaries who didn't really behave in a very nice way. And not that every Buddhist is, you know, a wonderful person, but um, I don't know. It feels to me more, less than a religion of more like a, a way to sort of a guide of how to live your life in a way that's in harmony with other people in the world. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that makes sense. And one of the things I've always liked about Buddhism is the, the idea of the bodhisattva, you know, mm -hmm. the, the one who sort of the, the warrior of compassion that you actually have to actively go out into the world and sort of defend the need for compassion mm -hmm. and, and treating people um, humanely, mm -hmm. I think, which I think is really fascinating because often we think about things like compassion or love as very passive. Mm -hmm. And so the way that they've kind of changed that model so that we understand, oh, it is actually an effort. It is an effort to exist in the world in this very specific way. In its work to change your mind and your thinking and, and owning your grief, owning your sadness, like just living with it and not, not you know, drinking or, or whatever it is that you do to avoid those feelings. Um, I think that's been really healing for me too in some parts of my life. So how do you deal with the needing to not attach that's not easy for people. Like not attaching yourself to people, not attaching yourself to ideas, not attach. I mean, I think that's one of the things that as I read through Buddhism, this idea of kind of this great emptiness, this mm. great void, this lack of attachment. And I only have a very superficial understanding relative to many people, but that's, that's a, for many people, I think that's kind of, that's a, that's scary. The idea of emptiness. It is. It's really scary. I remember it's kind of that feeling I had when I, I remember being like, six, I think six years old, seven years old, and that realization of death and being no longer. And I just couldn't understand it, I, the not being. And I still don't really understand, you know, the ego and getting rid of the ego and not attaching. It, it's not an easy concept to wrap your head around. And, you know, I, I, like I said, I, I've studied a little bit. I, I certainly don't, you know, know enough. Um, I think I could study it the rest of my life and not really understand, but there are parts of it that just, I have to say, resonate with me so much more than any of the religion, you know, and I went to Sunday school and we had, I went to a missionary high school missionary started Christian high school. So, um, you know, we had to take Bible study and that type of, and we were, the name of our sports team was the Crusaders. <laughs> kind of funny. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's just an always learning, changing, growing. Same with art, you know, it's all, of, I just don't want to do the always do the same thing. So how do you see the kind of intersections, parallels um, between the work that you've done as a graphic designer and a visual artist of a different sort? Is there, are, are there overlaps? Are they completely separate? How do you approach this? Yeah, definitely. Um, in fact, I think 
sometimes I feel like it's been detrimental because sometimes I feel like I'm too, um, my edges are too neat and tidy. And, you know, as a graphic designer, I'm very um, organized and I like things to be lined up and, you know, everything to work in the space. I think spatially, there's a real connection with um, perspective and, you know, how are you going to position that whatever it is is it a boat or is it you know are you gonna just put it right in the center you're gonna move it to the side it's the spatial organization I think definitely overlaps I remember at one time I wanted to loosen up I tried painting with my left hand that didn't go very well um so I'm always trying to loosen up and I think some uh that's still a goal for me is to loosen up a bit in my art. And yeah, this is something that I think about all the time. I, I am not an artist per se, like not a person who picks up a paintbrush. I would say I think about creativity a lot because my type of art is maybe writing or singing or something like that. But my day job is medicine administration and, and mostly pretty linear mm -hmm. similarly. And so I think about, you know, if on an ongoing basis, again, your neurons are kind of aligned in a certain way, the pathways are typically firing in a very specific way. Like, how do you like kind of pull, pull, pull those neurons apart and say, okay, let's create some space, mm -hmm. you know, let's make some different connections in a different way. How do you continue to kind of keep those other creative neurons firing so that you can somehow do both simultaneously. Yeah, I think it's a challenge. And, you know, working full time, I work for L.L. Bean. And, you know, it's it's a challenge to, to switch that gear. And but I am one of those people, I cannot stop making things. I'm constantly I knit, I, you know, I garden, I, I'm basically painting with my landscape, you know, with my plants, I have a huge garden and yard and um, I'm just constantly creating and doing things and making things. It's what makes me happy um, to, to create something, even if it's just like painting a wall in my house. Um, it's really satisfying. And I was talking to another artist recently about, about art and this feeling I get when I'm really into it and I'm painting something and I, and I'll put it aside and I'll, you know, I'll go to bed or whatever. I, I, first thing in the morning, I want to look at it again. And that's when I know that like, I'm really in the, in that zone. Um, and I really get into it and, and it'll come and go. Like I'll have weeks where I'll be like that. And then I'll have some time. I just need to rest maybe. My, and some days, you know, I'm like, oh, I have five hours to paint and I just sit there, lie there on the, <laughs> I'm like, I don't, I don't feel creative today. So I allow myself to, you know, it's okay. You do something else, go for a walk or whatever. I think I, I read or somebody told me once that one way to keep yourself engaged in your writing was to stop in the middle of a sentence. Oh. So that way you're right. It's kind of the writing kind of pulls you back in similar to what you're describing. Like you're, you're left with a sense of a lack of completion and, and you still want to go back and you want to explore further. Yes, absolutely. And that painting is, it's almost like it's calling, calling you, you know, and, and you can't walk by and you're like, Oh, I can't wait to get back to it. And that's when I think that's when magic happens is when you get into that feeling in that zone. And I also think that you're right about the space that even if your five hours that you thought you were going to paint, even if you're just looking at the clouds or going for mm -hmm. a walk, I mean, it's, it's almost as though you're, you're providing that it's, it's like a neuron bath, you know, that you're, you may not be doing something with your hands, but you're doing something inside yourself mm -hmm. so that it's, it's somehow coming to that next place where, Oh, I'm, I'm ready now. I can right. actually, I can do this. So I think that's very important. I'm also always just looking at everything. 
And I love finding those those little moments, you know, where you're like, oh, look at that window and those bottles in that window. Isn't that interesting, you know? And, you know, I wouldn't get that if I didn't go out for a walk or, or whatever, a drive. So I think all those moments are really important and make up the whole of being a creative person. If you're always looking at things, particularly if you're a visual person, do you ever reach a point of saturation where you say, okay, I've had too many things to look at. I've had too many things to work on at work. I have to somehow kind of shut down that, those senses, or does that not happen for you? I think what, what happens is that I, I still see them, but maybe I'm not sort of processing them in the same way, you know? So it's almost like you're looking at it, but you're not, it's like, like you drove home and you can't really remember how you got home. <laughs> um, I think that's what happens to me. Like sometimes I'm really like visually like, wow, that I'm really looking at something. And other times probably, you know, I've had a long day at work. I've been on the computer or whatever. Yeah, I may see it, but it may not make the same impact. So I know that you and I, we share a connection. My daughter-in-law's father is your colleague at LL yes. Bean. Um, and having been, and also you live, you live in Freeport and right. they live in Freeport. So you've been, you're connected with our family sort of tangentially, locally. Um, tell me about the sort of the, the Freeport community. I mean, the, the thing I remain fascinated by is you have L.L. Bean, which is enormous and a wonderful employer. And, but then you have all these neighborhoods that still exist mm. around this very large store that attracts people from literally all over the world. What has your experience been? Well, having kids, you know, in the school system and growing up, you know, they went all the way through Freeport schools. There's a community behind all that that, you know, people may not be aware of, but it's such a wonderful, it was such a wonderful community to be a part of. Um, I was involved in the whole renovation of the high school, um, a group of women, it started with book club, and we were talking about the high school was built in 1961. It was awful. There was terrible fields. I mean, it was known, well known, you know, people didn't even want to play on our fields. And so we got together, we painted, you know, the teacher's lounge. We did a few, and, and then we started talking, we need to really do something. And so we got some money from the town, uh, it was the town council or the school board to do a plan and it just snowballed, and now there's a new high school and a turf field, you know? So I think the community really came together and and got that done. But one thing I would, I would mention is something funny about, you know, kids being young. My son was in middle school or something, and, you know, you would... <clears throat> you would hear from another mother, you know, I just saw, you know, a bunch of boys with silly string, you know, <laughs> on Main Street. And, you know, so it, it, they couldn't get away with a whole lot because, you know, the, the parents were, had eyes out. Yes, I would think that between all the businesses and including L.L. Bean, that all the parents, like you probably, Freeport is not the place that you're going to want to try to engage no. in mischief. No, no. Yeah, because somebody would know someone, and yeah, it's in that sense, it's a, it's a small community when it comes to you know when you have your kids that are in school and. But yeah, it's been a wonderful place to live for thirty years since this is as long as I've lived anywhere outside of Korea. So, will you keep living here? Yeah. Yeah, my kids are settled here, and my daughter also also works at LL Bean. She started as an intern. Two, two years ago, and, and she's been hired full-time. So it's pretty nice. I mean, that's something that I've always thought is pretty magical about that particular company. Yeah. I mean, it's grown to this very well-known company um, around the world and, and large. It's probably one of the area's um, biggest employers, I would say. Yeah. And I, I think the idea that it is has brought not only recognition, but also created an economy around itself is, is pretty in incredible mm -hmm. really for a small state like Maine. Yeah. It's, it's been a fabulous place to, to work. And it's the thing I love about it is it's like family, 
you know, people have become like family and friends and it just, it, it's very, um, welcoming. It's, um, it's just a great place to be. I'm very fortunate. I, I've been self-employed pretty much my whole career until I went to L.L. Bean. And it was just on a temporary assignment. And then they asked me to stay. And I th thought, well, it might be nice to have health insurance and <laughs> a 401k. Because I had to, you know, do that all myself all those years. So, yeah, it's been it's been great. And I know that L.L. Bean similarly supports not just artists by employing them, but also I think a big part of their, even their mission is to, to bring artists in mm -hmm. and to actually sell their pieces. So I, I, I mean, they, there's local main authors and artisans. Right. And so it's not just the stuff that is created by L.L. Bean factories, but they're actually showcasing people who live here and in this, from this region. Right. And then the catalog, we have usually a painted cover every year, one of the catalogs. Uh, we hire illustrators to do different illustrated catalog covers. Um, so, yeah, it's it's kind of been fun to be on that side of, you know, hiring these people and looking at the work. It's really fun. So coming into the Portland Art Gallery, what what are some of your hopes and dreams what would you what would you like to see evolve in your career as an artist I guess I just would love to have more um just having more visibility I think um I think having all my art on the website is going to be so beneficial you know more people can see what's actually you know available um and and part of and being part of that community of other artists, I think, is really important to me, too. Um, so I th I'm really looking forward to that. And and having it be kind of like a family, almost like, you know, L.O. Bean. So it, I think there's, a, there's just going to be a lot of benefits. I'm always struck by, in the openings that are done for artists once a month at the Portland Art Gallery, um, other artists come to support mm -hmm. the fellow artists and... You know, families come, community members come, people who purchase the art come, and it, it really does kind of create this ongoing connection. So once a month on a Thursday, the first Thursday of every month from five to seven, you know, you can go and you can, you could find your people to hang out with. Right. Which right. is, it's a little bit like church. It's just, yeah. uh, you know, no religion exactly, but still a place to gather. I also am amazed, like I, I, I've thought about this for years, about how just generous main artists are to each other and how open and how non-competitive. I would have expected, you know, in some of these situations that I've been in for it, it to feel more competitive and maybe it's different in other parts of the country, but main artists are so supportive of each other. I've done so many trades, you know, oh, I like your painting. Oh, I like your painting. Let's trade. You know, I have all this original artwork from doing that and people giving advice, you know, don't do that show, do this show. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a really wonderful giving in kind community of artists that I've have been privileged to be a part of. Well, Catherine, I know you and I have known each other for a few years, but it's nice to be able to reconnect with yeah, you. Yeah, thank you. I've enjoyed my conversation Thanks with so you much. today. I'm Dr. Lisa Belisle, and you have been listening to or watching Radio Maine, our video podcast that celebrates and explores creativity and the human spirit and is sponsored and produced by the Portland Art Gallery, located in Portland, Maine, and now where you will find artist Catherine Breer. I encourage you to come to maybe one of our openings, but definitely go to the website or spend some time in person admiring her art because I certainly do. Thank you very much for being here today. Thank you. Thank you.